Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. To ensure that we'll have a smooth webinar over the next 90 minutes, please take note of the following house rules. All information provided in this webinar is for your general information only and does not contain, contain nor convey any type of legal information. All the materials presented in this webinar belongs to the organizers and the speakers. This webinar is being recorded. You will be muted by default when you join this webinar. There is a Q&A function on Zoom which is now open. At any point of time, you can click on the Q&A button to pose your questions to the speakers. For the questions that are unanswered, we will work with the speakers after this session to get back to you via written responses. As such, please ensure that the name and company which you have entered into your Zoom account is accurate. Global Connect at SBF helps Singapore businesses expand into overseas markets. Since November 2019, we have guided Singapore businesses as they seize business opportunities in Asia and beyond. From identifying emerging trends to closing deals, we provide a full spectrum of overseas business expansion services. With Global Connect at SBF, you can learn about new markets, customers, and free trade agreements across the globe, land opportunities, and scale up in new markets, both physically and digitally, localize overseas operations to ensure sustainable long-term success. Our Singapore enterprise centers in Indonesia and Vietnam also provide on-the-ground business and market development services. We also provide a dedicated digital B2B marketplace to quickly scale your business overseas. With Global Connect B2B, set up your company profile in minutes and start contacting thousands of regional partners and customers. Last year, Global Connect at SBF reached out to over 2,000 companies, completing many overseas expansion projects through its network of trusted business specialists and professionals. In 2021, Global Connect at SBF will also launch new initiatives for Singapore businesses to position themselves on the international stage. Explore business opportunities across ASEAN, South Asia, Japan, and other markets by joining us at Festival, our flagship digital event. Become part of the Global Connect at SBF community today and start enjoying exclusive benefits. Customize business advice, access to our overseas Singapore enterprise centers, preferential rates for services, as well as structured training, one-on-one -on -one advisory, and assistance on using free trade agreements to extract greater commercial advantages abroad. Global Connect at SBF, connecting your business to global opportunities. That was our short video on Global Connect at SBF. We help Singapore businesses to learn, lend, and localize. Learn with us about markets, new customers, and free trade agreements. Lend with us through our dedicated digital spaces, established networks, and hands-on advice and facilitation. And localize with us through our trusted relationships abroad to deepen your presence and secure your long-term sustainability. Imagine a future where our electricity is generated from clean and renewable energy, which is already existing on our planet, the sunshine. By installing solar panels on top of our HDBs, schools, factories, and warehouses, energy from the photons will be turned into electricity. 
this electricity is free of pollution, it does, it does not contain any harmful emission, and is constantly being replenished. As long as the sun shines, solar energy will be here to power our home appliances and run our machineries. According to the World Economic Forum since 2010, the world's solar energy capacity has increased by 700%. And the economists further reported that in 2020, 132 billion watts of new solar generating capacity were installed around the world. Singapore is also ramping up its drive to soak up more energy from the sun. Under the Singapore Green Plan 2030, the target is to increase the use of solar energy to five times that of today, able to power more than 350,000 households a year. Hello and welcome to Financing for Solar Projects, the second episode in our Sustainable Financing Awareness series. The SBF is very pleased to be working together with UOB as our knowledge partner on a series of webinars revolving around different topics of sustainable financing every month. So whether you are a large corporate or small SME, whether you're an engineer or property developer, whether you're in aviation, maritime or land transportation, we hope to increase your awareness and understanding of sustainable financing for solar projects today and leave this webinar thinking in terms of how to harness new opportunities in this fast growing sector in Singapore and beyond. My name is Shulin from the Singapore Business Federation and I'm very pleased to be your host and moderator for today's virtual event. So ladies and gentlemen, we have an exciting lineup of speakers for you today. Over the next one hour, you'll be hearing from three esteemed speakers. First, our knowledge partner, UOB. Second, a Singapore company, Bright People Renewable Energy, or RPRE, with many years of experiences operating in Indonesia on solar projects. And third, from V3 Energy, a renewable project and engineering and advisory company. In between the three speakers, we will be conducting two polling sessions with you, our dear audience watching this from your home. And about 4 p.m., we will start the Q&A session. So ladies and gentlemen, you can key in your questions uh, to address to the speakers at any point of time using the Q&A function on your Zoom account throughout this webinar. If you're a Singapore company interested in exploring solar projects overseas or have any questions regarding solar financing in Singapore and abroad, please sign up for our free business consultation session and email my colleague Zi Quan and representatives from SBF and UOB will be happy to meet with you and offer you a tailored consultation session free of charge to assist you on your sustainability financing and internationalization journey. So to kick, to kick off this event, I would like to invite Mr. Jasper Wong, Head of Construction and Infrastructure, Sector Solutions Group, UOB, to tell us more about solar financing. Jasper joined UOB in 2013 to head the Infrastructure Project Finance Team for Asia before taking up the current role as Head of Construction and Infrastructure in UOB. He has got more than 25 years of experience in project and structured finance across the region, dealing with finance projects in the sectors of renewable energy, oil and gas, and infrastructure. Jasper will tell us more about driving environmental responsibility through UOB's U Solar program. Jasper, please. Thank you. Thank you, Shu. Um, it is a, a honor to be invited uh, to speak at this uh, conference. And, and we are, we're so glad that, uh, you know, to be part of this sustainability finance uh, uh, webinar, uh, simply because I think the, the 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 demand as well as the interest uh, from companies and clients as well uh, has has pushed us towards uh, developing you know what we call our youth solar program. So what today uh, I'm gonna share about you know how we look at the uh, the power opportunities uh, and then uh, we also have um, uh, the, uh, you know esteemed speakers on on this webinar that will share with you about the their their experience in in uh, implementing solar and also on the technical side so with that uh, i will just go into uh the the presentation so i mean i, I want to start this off in terms of what's happening in the electric city market right i i think a lot of us have heard 
about you know what has happened you know recently uh, with the government the Singapore uh, green plan but I want to tell you that actually this the the journey has actually started uh, way before uh, the Singapore government announced the Singapore green plan 2030 now um so in that uh, fateful day back in uh, 2016 uh, in May, uh, actually Germany uh, had a very unusual event whereby you know the sun was shining, the wind is blowing, uh, and they they have generated so much renewable power. Actually, the consumers are getting paid for for using energy. So you can imagine that if this uh, can happen in uh, in germany hopefully one day it will happen in singapore as well whereby you know as once we switch on you know our our lights or, or our tv we actually get paid for using the electricity so this is a uh, a chart that shows in terms of the investment uh, year on year change uh, comparing renewable investments and and fossil fuel and the uh, the the uh, pivotal point came in 2017 whereby the total investment in renewable uh, energy actually surpasses fossil fuel. And this continued to be so, uh, you know, over the, over the last couple of years. So as you can see that since 2017, the investment in emerging markets have actually soared beyond fossil fuel. And despite COVID last year in 2020, the, invest, the investment or the capacity built out for solar globally uh, continues to grow. So we are expecting about 140 to 150 gigawatt of, uh, uh, of solar energy being built uh, around the world. So as you can see, not even COVID can stop the build out of uh, renewable energy. Now, uh, the other thing that we have also been seeing is the disruption in the electricity uh, sector. So back in 2017, GE started to cut its capacity in terms of their their fossil fuel uh, turbine business, uh, whereby they have to do a reorganization in uh, in the business. And then we later on see that uh, there was also articles being written about ASEAN being the new hub for renewable energy for, for the obvious reasons that, you know, there is a lot of demand. Uh, and also there is uh, also capacity for Asia or ASEAN to actually use renewable energy uh, as, a, as a viable source. And obviously, uh, last year, we hear uh, from our MTI, um, uh, Chan Chun, Minister Chan Chun Singh, talk about uh, Singapore to import electricity from Malaysia. Now, it, from the surface of it, uh, it may not look quite significant because it's only 100 megawatt, but that actually opens up a whole new uh, environment in terms of how you should be looking at uh, electricity and the market itself. Uh, we used to think that Singapore is an island by itself, but with this interconnectivity, that changes completely the landscape for uh, for Singapore and how uh, you should be looking at it when you are thinking about investing uh, in solar as a developer. But as a as an end user, I see this as a, as a plus as well as for companies who want to go into renewable energy. Then we also look at how climate change has impact BAU. Right, and uh, back in 2018, PG&E is the first company that succumbed uh, to, to go into bankruptcy because of climate change. This is due to an equipment uh, that is belonging to the company that causes a whole forest fire, fire in California, uh, which starts to get the CFO thinking about, you know, uh, you know, how they should be looking at their business. And then most recently, as you, as you know, back in May, uh, there's this big uh, Dutch court uh, that has uh, uh, rendered a decision against uh, uh, Royal Dutch Shell uh, to push them to make even deeper cuts uh, regards to their uh, uh, carbon emissions. So you may think that this, uh, this may not impact me very much, but it's going to impact the industry itself. And there's another case that currently pending uh, for Total in France. So do think again that uh, how climate change is impacting your business and, uh, and why you should think harder now, given that, you know, it may have uh, financial consequences to your, to your business. Now, with regards to key renewable uh, trends, uh, we are seeing four things that's happening. 
uh, in the energy space. So one is smart and sustainable city that's coming up, declining generation costs, uh, lower battery uh, storage costs, as well as sustainability uh, reporting uh, around the region. Now, when we talk about smart and sustainable city, we, we cannot escape uh, to talk about the fact that uh, smart grids are coming up. You know, we heard a lot about smart grid. So what is smart grid? Smart grid is effectively a decentralization of the power supply, you know, with a bilateral flow of electricity and data. We used to have generation, uh, 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 distribution, uh, transmission and distribution, whereas now everything is intermingled together because now you have solar, you have wind, you have battery storage, and uh, where your home, your home can also be a, a, a prosumer as well. So with all this uh, coming online gradually, um, the energy company will need to use IoT sensors and, and also technology to be able to foresee what are, where are the power demand, where are the power supply, and how they balance the load. So this is something that will be a game changer uh, for, uh, for the region. The other thing that we're seeing as well is also reaching grid parity. So as you can see on the line, on the left, uh, solar is now uh, coming down to really competitive rates that actually will make the installed capacity on the per kilowatt basis uh, a, a more sustainable uh, energy, especially from a levelized uh, cost of energy perspective. Um, the other game changer we are seeing that we, we talked about a lot uh, these days is EV. And obviously why EV is taking off is also because battery costs have also come down. As you can see on the left hand side, the chart uh, whereby the, the battery on a per kilowatt hour basis have come down to about 137, uh, which is about you know close to 90% of reduction uh, over the last uh, over the last decade. So you can you can foresee that um, uh, the the battery storage will continue to drive the business. Uh, and somebody says that you know uh, to reach our uh, 60,000 uh, install uh, e, uh, uh, battery charging station. In the, we the Singapore needs to install around 500 charger per day every day. Yeah, for the next 10 years. Um, the other things that is driving sustainability is obviously uh, the um, sustainability re, uh, reporting as well as sustainability investing. Now, if you look on the left hand chart you see that the, the, all the indexes that are related to ESG has actually outperformed uh, the, your normal uh, index, uh, S&P 500 index. And the companies on the right are, are some of the companies that have been listed on the Dow Jones Sustainable Index and also the Robico Sam uh, yearbook. So that, that gives us an idea that uh, companies are now thinking more harder about uh, their sustainability reporting uh, including not just about solar, but including holistically how uh, they are driving their business. Yeah, so I hope that this gives you uh, an idea of what's happening on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the energy space. Now, I just want to go through really quickly on, on our Use Solar program. I think uh, most of you may have heard about Use Solar program, but if not, then, you know, I, I'll just take you through quickly. Now, um, with regards to Southeast Asia, as you can see, the solar irradiance, uh, it, it ranges from uh, 1,005 to 1,009 kilowatt hour per, per meter square. So that equates about three and a half to six hours uh, of sunlight, direct sunlight each day. So that actually makes it ideal for us to tap on uh, the, the solar energy. And when we, when we develop our youth solar program, we actually consider quite a lot of things. When we look at the RE targets being set by the Southeast Asian government, we look at the cost of installation uh, over the last decade that has dropped about 90%. We look at the potential uh, new capacity to be built, you know, over the, over the next couple of years, which is about 96 gigawatt and roughly around three and a, 3.3 and a half times uh, the combined install capacity in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. And that's where the magnitude that we see, and not forgetting the, about the 60, uh, 66 million tons of uh, CO2 be, uh, that can be avoided. Now, if you ask us about, you know, what kind of financing uh, or what kind of solar rooftop scheme uh, that you should be considering. Now, there are four types in general. So one is the original out outright purchase. So you, you just go 
and uh, you know ask for somebody to come and install and then you pay for it the other type is equipment leasing so equipment leasing effectively you just pay a fixed amount over a period of time and you just uh, basically amortize your 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 uh, payment to a fixed payment uh, every month or every quarter then you have the rooftop PPA. So rooftop PPA, effectively, you sign a long-term purchase agreement with a solar company that will provide you the power for you to install on your roof so that you can enjoy. The last uh, scheme that usually we see is rooftop rental. So effectively, you just rent your roof out to somebody who wants to install uh, on your roof, and then they will pay you regardless of whether uh, electricity is being generated from the roof. Now, in terms of uh, whether you should consider purchase or lease, um, you, there, there are two things that we usually uh, tell people. One is you consider whether uh, do you want to be the owner and you want to maximize your benefit if you are looking at the purchase model. Why do I say that? Is because if you do a purchase model, uh, uh, you, you effectively pay off your, your equipment uh, costs uh, quickly. And then after that, you enjoy the full benefit from the savings of the of the solar system. Now, this also uh, can increase your market value of your building and, and not only save you on your electricity cost. The other thing that um, that uh, you should consider as a leasing model is when you uh, would not want to have go through the hassle of installation of operating it uh, and also calculating the electricity and things like that. So. You will, you will find a solar company will do all that for you and at zero upfront cost. So the, the solar company will come in and install it for you. And then you pay over, you sign a long-term uh, power purchase agreement for 15, 20 years. And then you you effectively amortize that over the same period. Okay, so this is the uh, youth solar program that we have across Southeast Asia. As you can see, we, we have 15 partners now across the region. And um, these partners are how we choose them is uh, is from uh, industry uh, knowledge as well as local champions. Um, from a UOB perspective, we want to promote uh, solar. The second thing is also to promote champions within each country. I'll share a bit more on why we are doing this. So, U Solar Program is the first integrated solar energy platform. Um, uh, you know, for for the region, it still is. Uh, there are three things that we wanted to do. One is to promote sustainability awareness. That's number one. Second thing is to help our uh, solar ecosystem players, whether you're developers, contractors, operators. And also the third thing is to simplify the sustainability uh, with the end user solar financing. Yeah, so these are the three objectives where we have embarked on. And, and I can say that, uh, you know, we are quite proud of it because we have received awards, you know, uh, for best green loan in Thailand for, for our portfolio financing, as well as recognition from the government of Malaysia, from NEA, uh, for, for contributing to sustainability financing. Now, in terms of the promoting sustainability awareness, you know, we, we actually walk through the journey with our clients. So we don't just say, hey, you know, you have a, you have a solar financing, you come and talk to us. But whereas we actually help uh, our partners, uh, our clients as well, uh, to go through the process in terms of consultation, site visit, and then we put up the loan proposal, and then the installation is usually about you know three to six months on rooftop, and then after that you enjoy your savings for the next uh, twenty years. Now, the these are the four comprehensive financing solutions that we have uh, for the ecosystem. So we don't just cater for one customers or one type of customers. Uh, but what we wanted to do is to look comprehensively across the value chain. So we have financing for solar developers. So if you are a solar developer, whether it's, uh, it's rooftop or ground mount, we can look at it uh, and provide a financing for your customers uh, on your behalf. Or we can look at a solar EPC contractor. So if you are just a pure installer, we have a working capital or value chain financing for you. Uh, from an end user perspective, obviously, if you are a building owner or factory owner, we currently have a package for up to two million of a seven years uh, loan tenor uh, for you. And for UOB customers, obviously, we have a, we have a fast track program uh, for them. Now, if you are a, a home owner as well, 
So uh, if you have a UOV credit card, you can actually tap on our credit card program, uh, whereby 0% interest uh, and for up to uh, uh, installment for up to 36 months. So you cannot go lower than that. Yeah. Now, um, next, uh, I want to just quickly share about the smart city uh, sustainable finance uh, framework that we have uh, because this is uh, something that some of our clients really liked it because um, they say, hey, they, you know, if I'm going to go ahead and install solar, you know, what kind of benefits do I get, right? So if you if you tap on the UOB uh, uh, loan, uh, we can actually give you a, a green loan without you going through, uh, going through uh, the certification yourself. So by having a sustainable finance framework, it basically streamlines the process for end user. So if you are an end user, you want to take up a loan, you you go th get through the hassle of, of setting up a framework for your company. We, we have already done that. You just tap on our framework, no additional cost to you. And we can also standardize the reporting format yeah, for, for the company as well. So this is uh, just some of the illustrations that uh, we, we usually give to our clients in terms of if you install on your factory one and a half megawatt uh, of system, uh, it will roughly cost about 1.8 uh, million sing. Uh, currently, I think it, it uh, probably have gone down slightly as well. Uh, this shows that you the CO2 savings per year is about 650,000 kilograms, uh, 30,000 trees planted, 140 cars taken off the road. Savings, most important, uh, about 290,000 per annum. Yeah, if you are a homeowner, so let's say if you if you install a six kilowatt uh, in your in in your home or in your rooftop, um, it's about costs about eight thousand uh, and below, and uh, you know you you are doing contributing to the the environment by reducing fifty to fifty thousand kilograms of uh, CO two over the next twenty years. Uh, Twelve cars taken off the road. Now those are not those are ICT cars, I guess. Um, if if you are thinking of going EV, then obviously you are also doing uh, con making your contribution to to the environment. Savings about a thousand one hundred uh, per per year. Uh, this is also another article that was uh, featured uh, in the Straits Times about one of our customers who actually have installed. Uh, he was, uh, so he, he first came to us and, and said he wanted to install, so use one of our used solar partners. Uh, and then uh, after that, he started enjoying the savings about 200 per month in, in, their house, in his house. And he, uh, he was so convinced that he actually quit his job as an engineer and then set up his own firm uh, to, to look at how to commercialize uh, solar power. So that's, that's a very encouraging uh, testimony that we, we are sharing. So a couple of other things uh, before I end um, uh, on the selected cases uh, on uh, on deal disclosure. So so these are some of the examples that we have on residential projects uh, in Singapore. Uh, one is a, a nine kilowatt uh, uh, capacity, and uh, the other one is about twenty one kilowatt. So it's that's, that's quite a quite a, a big size for a residential home. Uh, the other cases that uh, I, I want to bring us are interesting cases. So in Indonesia, we actually have a uh, a hair salon uh, uh, business who came to us and said they want to uh, see how they can save money because hair salon does use a lot of uh, electricity and uh, they install a almost a seven kilowatt peak uh, system and they're very happy because the savings on their business on the electricity bill is roughly about 40%. So that's that's uh, that's quite a happy customers that we have. Then uh, in Malaysia, obviously Penang. Uh, this is a, a example in Penang, six hundred fifty kilowatt. It's a it's a factory that uh, that we have helped the customers to to install, and um, they they are estimating about two hundred forty thousand of cost savings a year. Yeah. Now, the other two examples are, are slightly different, so I, I can share with you. You know, this is a, uh, a portfolio of 210 rooftops. This is a, a financing that uh, that uh, we have done for Sunsip, uh, one of our used solar partners for 37 megawatt. This is the part of the Solar Nova project, uh, as well as some commercials. Uh, and and you, as you can see, that the the size uh, is is quite uh, commendable. Uh, the other one that we have is uh, is a 800 uh, residential rooftop in Thailand that we have helped our partners finance, uh, KG, 
And, uh, and this also uh, another example is that uh, how businesses can actually uh, take advantage of the, of the solar, uh, in, uh, uh, sort of the solar uh, industry trend. Um, lastly, I, th I think I uh, just want to uh, show you, you know, if you are not aware of the Use Solar program, you can scan the QR code uh, or just uh, Google Use Solar UOB and, and it will take you to the website and, and you feel free to, to browse around. Last thing, right? Um, I think I just want to end off and say that uh, the, uh, the time to act is now. I, I think uh, this is a quote from Albert Einstein to say the world will not be destroyed by those who do, do, do evil, but it's by those who uh, do nothing, right? And, and just watch the, the world go by. So my, my message is it's time to act now and to catch the sun. All right, with that, I, I will end. Thanks uh, very much. I'll pass the time back to Shu. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Jasper. And indeed, the, the time to act is now, is now and we need to catch the sun. So audiences who are watching this webinar, you can feel free to type your questions at any point of time using the Q&A function for our speakers. And before we move on to our second speaker, we would like to get your thoughts in our first polling session. Think about sustainable financing and how it relates to your business. Why are you not tapping into it at the moment? And if we are keen on sustainable financing, in which specific area are you most interested in? May I have the poll questions launched, please? You will see a poll with three questions on your screen. Answer all the questions and click on submit. We are privileged to have Mr. Robin Poe. Founder and CEO of Right People Renewable Energy with us today. RPRE is a clean tech startup with a focus on the triple bottom line of people, planet and profit. And as a renewable energy specialist headquartered in Singapore, it has a mission to help its clients transit from dirty fossil fuel energy sources to clean re renewable energy. And in Singapore, RPRE has actually helped our local fish farm situated off a Singapore's Pulau Samarkau switch to solar energy. And even after the switch, I heard that the dolphins have even come back to the fish farm area. And in Indonesia, it has a long experience of helping off-grid plantations and island resorts transit from diesel to solar energy. And what's most interesting also is that just last year, RPRE has issued its first mini green bond for impact investors for a resort in Indonesia. Now for Indonesia, it's actually one of the world's fastest growing economy. It has a population of 270 million people and a growing middle class. And when it comes to top destinations for SBF members to internationalize, it always comes up as one of the top few. So I, I'm very pleased now to call upon Robin to share with us his presentation on solar challenges and opportunities in Indonesia. Robin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Shu. Yeah, so thanks for inviting me. It's really an honor to come and speak at this event. Uh, thank you, UOB, SPF, and really Enterprise Singapore as well. Uh, really, today, I'm just going to cover a little introduction about RPRE and who we are, what we do, and our experience in Indonesia, and then some of the opportunities that we have in Indonesia and the challenges working in Indonesia as well. So a little bit about us. So what we do is we kind of do a full spectrum. We like to call ourselves like the special forces of renewable energy. We go down to a site in small groups into remote areas where there's no access to water, internet, you know, energy, and then help clients do energy audits, do energy efficiency advisory or offer solutions and decarbonize by helping them switch from diesel, if usually to solar batteries. And we also help take care of them long-term as well, providing the o and and uh, for today's topic, we're going to focus a little bit more about the financing because I think that's one of the largest challenges that we had. So let me just share, RPRE is a second generation family business. We are part of the RP group. Um, my parents were born in Indonesia, in West Papua. So in Sorong and Jayapura for the Indonesians who are on this call. I know I have some friends here on this call. Hi guys. So yeah, my dad was born in Indonesia and uh, he started a manpower business to supply uh, manpower to the oil and gas industry. 
And that's how it really started. So you can see the Singaporean Indonesian companies there. And then we also have RPRE, which was started in 2018 after I did my EMBA with INSEAD. And we also have the family office side because of my private banking background and, and, uh, and the nonprofit side as well. So this is our group. So when Shu mentioned that we have a lot of experience, uh, it's really about 40 years of experience in Indonesia, where I grew up, where we speak the language, where we have contacts and networks and where my parents and family were from. So as a family business, we really think in long term, we don't just think of quarterly uh, results, you know, uh, our reputation is very important. We, we think of the next generation, we think of how our kids will actually come into the business if they want to, and really what is it that we stand for, what are our values. So we really believe that family business is a force for good. And uh, in Singapore, we've also been awarded the Champions of Good recently. Um, we are registered as a social enterprise here in Singapore. We hire persons with disabilities within our organization. And in Indonesia, we even hire Afghanistan refugees as well as part of our workforce. Um, Ref um, World Refugee Day is actually coming uh, on the 21st of June, and we're going to be making some big announcements about our involvement with refugees as well. And last but not least, we're actually the only certified B Corp um, in Southeast Asia to do renewable energy. This was a huge challenge and took us a long time to be it, but we really believe in people, planet, profit. So it's not just about financial return, but it's also how we involve the people and the planet as well. Mm, I can't, okay. Yep, so this is our presence. Um, we have an uh, office in Singapore. This is where our headquarters is. And that's where really we should, I encourage all of you to leverage on Enterprise Singapore and SPF to support you to grow into Indonesia. I mean, we had the benefit of our family being from Indonesia. So that, that provides some local context. But I think uh, to have the support of government bodies or organizations like SPF and ESG is, is extremely important. And UOB being a regional bank as well, we have presence in both uh, countries. I think that's super helpful. But currently our offices are in Singapore, Jakarta, Bali, and Manado, and we're looking to expand into the other parts of Indonesia. As you can see, Indonesia is beyond Bali and Jakarta. It's three different time zones. It's a huge place. To fly from one end to the other end, there's, there's no direct flight and it takes you about 10 hours. So it's Indonesia is a really big market. And many of these places are actually off-grid. They don't have access to the central energy grid and will still be requiring diesel generators or even their own uh, power plant, whether it's coal or whether it's uh, bio, uh, but typically it's diesel. Um, this is just our office addresses. And this is just uh, have a feel for our team. So we're a lean team still. We're about three and a half years old. Uh, you can see us here visiting the REC factory here in Singapore. I think uh, Indonesians really respect and like the, the values that Singapore stands for, whether it's uh, non-corruptibility, you know, uh, very professional, uh, very business focused, you know, and, and um, yeah, I think that that brand, the Singapore brand is extremely important to leverage on as well. So our mission is really to help off-grid CNI clients switch from dirty energy to clean renewable energy. And I mentioned before, our focus is people, planet, profit, and our core values are step-by-step, -step, safety, teamwork, education, and professionalism. So we won a couple of awards as well, you know, and really glad that uh, in our short three and a half years, uh, we've been validated by quite a lot of organizations. Um, I think the ones that we're really quite proud of is actually uh, the Enabling Employers Award, where we can see my colleague there, um, Mr. Takian, uh, receiving his hearing impact, but he's our finance and admin manager. And he's really uh, taking care of all our ACRA, our GST, our cross-border taxation issues and audit accounts. So um, really great to have uh, his, his support as one of our earliest employees. Um, I won't go into the other uh, awards. So our model is really B to B to BOP. So business to business and also to the bottom of the pyramid or the base of the pyramid. Um, I think it's a bit challenging to try and sell to the bottom of the pyramid. I think there's a lot of credit issues and, and uh, collection issues that, that uh, I think can be overcome with technology, perhaps with a super app like uh, GoTo or Grab or, you know, and, um, but I think uh, for us, we've decided to focus on the CNI space and they already have long-term relationships with the villagers, with the remote communities on the ground as well. So on the bottom left, you can see the picture of our staff who was wearing the yellow polo tees, working with local villagers just uh, from the village beside the resort to actually help assemble our um, solar farm on the uh, resort. I'll go a little bit into the case study a little bit more. So in terms of value chain, we don't manufacture anything ourselves. I think majority of the equipment comes from China and you have tier one, tier two, tier three kind of uh, manufacturers. And we only work with the top brands because we want to ensure long-term, once again, I mentioned family business, long-term reliability and stability, warranties for long-term as well. 
there are no moving parts in the solar system. So really you have uh, very little maintenance uh, except for monitoring and cleaning. And uh, you have a great reliability from system performance, product performance. So we play the distributor and EPC role, as you can see in the second column. And uh, we also offer our clients some financing solutions as well, working with partners like uh, UOB and, and some other platforms as well. But I think a lot more with impact investors um, and there's a growing market in that space. So our customer segmentation is really in the CNI space off-grid and the reason why we focus on off-grid is it's a lot more expensive for our clients to power the operations if you don't just look at the cost of fuel you look at what just mentioned earlier about lcoe the levelized cost of energy you have to factor in manpower transportation maintenance you know uh, having multiple sets of diesel generators all these costs ended up actually makes it very expensive for off-grid areas to um to 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 have energy and that's why the, uh, it's a sweet spot. Typically, our clients break even in three to five years, you know, and it's, it's really uh, makes financial sense, makes economic sense, makes environmental and social sense to actually switch to renewable energy. So we also address the SEGs, and these are the ones that we focus on. And let me talk a little bit about Indonesia's potential. Indonesia's potential. So as I said, a uh, huge place, Shu mentioned 270 million people. I mean, many people don't even have an NRIC. So I think the exact population is even hard to ascertain. But it's not in the cities. There's so many remote areas, multiple islands, you know, um, thousands of islands. And these are all places like what you see here, and they all need energy. I think figuratively, this is maybe what it might look like, and we want to change that. So let me share one of the projects that we're most proud of. This is actually a resort, eco resort in the north of uh, Sulawesi, Manado. It's called Ganga Island Resort and Spa. They used to be spending about $10,000 a month on diesel generation, uh, uh, diesel and using three or four diesel generators. And we helped them install the solar and battery project and uh, switch uh, to clean renewable energy. I think in the span of just two months after we installed everything, we saw turtles come and lay their eggs on the beach, which is the first time they've never seen in 10 years. We saw a dugong at the jetty as well. And then all the flora and fauna started to flourish on the island. And guests, of course, were very happy to, to see that the eco resort was really walking the talk. But what was interesting is that we also issued a mini green bond. And I don't think I will, I'll go through line by line, but maybe the next uh, illustration will be uh, better. So this is typically how it is. RPRE comes in to advise our client, you know, who has a factory, a resort, you know, and they're running off diesel generators. Um, they engage us, they pay a down payment, and then we install the solar panels. Um, in this case, uh, we allow the client to pay five years, over five years, the installment. And at that time, I wish I knew Yobi earlier. Uh, we, we actually had to use our own balance sheet to uh, finance the project and then allow the client to pay us uh, over five years. So we had another four years of accounts receivables come in. Uh, we tried to go to the bank to refinance this and i can say that just three four years ago it was still very challenging and i think there's so much more acceptance and so much more support for green financing just in the last uh, 12 to 24 months so we tried working with a bank and it was challenging back then so what we did was we actually worked with um, a law firm to help us and advise us and very grateful for uh, l and w to help us on this mini green bond and we work with impact investors so two impact investors came one family office and one individual they actually gave us three hundred thousand dollars up front so that we can actually uh, repay them over four years the three hundred ninety thousand. The effective return for them is about 7.7% in USD terms, and they were happy to do so. You know, they have a, a humble uh, financial return in terms of the mini green bond, but they are actually very passionate about the impact they give as well. So every six months, we have to submit a sustainability report showing our clean energy generation, as well as the social impact we have uh, to our impact investors. Um, for something closer to home, this is actually the fish farm project that we talked about in uh, Off Pulau Sumaka, which you mentioned. And uh, it's a local brand, Kubara Barramundi Asia. Very glad to have them as our clients as well. Um, I think we are very glad that we started early because uh, they were running off diesel generators. And then we went in there to install solar and batteries. And now it's all clean and silent and it, it saves money and saves the environment. And then COVID happened. So actually, if there were actually travel restrictions or resupply uh, constrictions because of checking in, because of supply constraints, um, they will be very much hampered as well just for diesel resupply. So the fact that they switch over to solar and batteries actually enable the operations to be a lot smoother as well. Yeah. So I think uh, many fish farms are looking at solar and batteries as well. And um, yeah, happy to, to do this. Um, another 
project that we're hoping to do in the or looking to do in the next six months is actually uh, something 10 times larger than the Fish Farm Hospital. And that's really the floating hospital project in Indonesia. It's a great NGO called Dr. Share, and they've been around for more than 10 years. And they go to remote areas to actually do uh, simple medical procedures, to do anti-stunting work, nutrition, and actually so many babies have been delivered in, in that hospital. And, and many of the, the uh, villagers have named uh, their children after the doctor, Dr. Lee. So um, yeah, these are the kind of projects that we want to do. Not only does it make financial sense for the client to switch to clean energy, but it helps uh, the, the, the community in the remote areas as well uh, switch to uh, yeah, do great work. Then they can just focus on their medical. I mean, a lot of times people start with wanting to save money. And I think that's probably a good motivation. But they also realize that if they go to a remote area and they had to buy, say, 10,000 barrels of diesel, it wouldn't be possible for them to get operations. The area is already struck by disaster, or it's already a remote area. It wouldn't be, it would be actually irresponsible to actually try and soak up all and, and buy and hoard all that uh, diesel fuel. So what's better than to just put solar panels onto your roof, let money fall from the sky and power your operations. So we're very excited about this project and um, we're currently fundraising. We've already secured 200,000 out of 400,000 and looking for more impact investors to get involved with us as well. So working in Indonesia, um, I think I have about seven minutes left to speak. Um, I think Indonesia used to have a negative list and it was quite challenging to, and quite protectionist, I would say, <coughs> in terms of what you could do in Indonesia, there's lots of red tape, but there's a new omnibus law just uh, organized this year. And it's really about simplifying the whole uh, business uh, operations. Uh, President Jokowi is actually super, um, uh, passionate and insistent on trying to improve the ease of uh, doing business in Indonesia. And he's always telling his ministers, you know, we need to improve, we need to cut red tape, we need to actually make it pro-business. And uh, so I think it's good news for all these Singaporean companies here on this call who actually want to explore Indonesia. And of course, if you're partners with ESG or, or SBF or Global Connect, it'll be super easy as well. I think in Indonesia, I want to state that it's absolutely possible to actually do business without paying any under table money or any bribes as possible. I think as a Singapore company, as, an, as a certified B Corp, this is actually something we're very strong about. And um, you may lose business, you may actually lose out on some deals, but I think you'll be rewarded in the end. So I would say those who are worried about, you know, um, uh, uh, this, this issue, uh, it's, uh, let me assure you that it is certainly possible. You'll get quality clients, you'll get quality ecosystem and people who actually don't cut corners and want to do things the right way. So I think this is a good model to do so. Um, and maybe I also share about the KPK or KPK. It's actually like Singapore's CPIB. Indonesians are very patriotic people and they really want to see their country improve. So they're really against corruption and they really want to overcome it as well. So I think if your organization stands out as well and says that, hey, this is not something that we want to do, um, yeah, uh, they will support that, you know, and, and they won't look at you as like, oh, you're, you're high and mighty and you don't want to do things in a local way. So let me just encourage you to, to stand by this as well. Um, having said that, there's a lot of logistical challenges, you know, like I said, Indonesia is a huge place. Um, it was actually more expensive to ship our solar equipment domestically within Indonesia versus uh, from Europe. So I think uh, even though it's local, there's the uh, supply chain matters still uh, cause a huge challenge and uh, you really need to have a good uh, local partner to support that in your, in your operations. Um, we also take for granted the internet connection. Um, in Singapore, if you have like a maybe a blackout of Wi-Fi for like 30 minutes or one hour, you know, everyone's complaining. But I think uh, we are blessed here in Singapore, but in Indonesia, so many people are unbanked or don't have access to energy or don't have access to the internet. And uh, even fishermen or even farmers in the remote villages that we operate in, they don't have uh, direct access to prices. So when they actually buy a fish, they don't know which one is more valuable, which one to consume, which one to sell. But uh, when we go to a remote area, we try to supply not just clean energy, but clean water as well as internet access. And that way we share it with the local community and they'll also be able to trade and actually get a, a better pricing and cut out the middleman. So internet connection is always a challenge. Like I'm sure some of you have done, <coughs> excuse me, some calls, video calls with your Indonesian partners. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, especially when it's raining, you will see that internet is a huge problem. Um, power supply as well. I think uh, you can have a huge industrial park and then have like a 10,000 square foot space, but then, 
power supply is not something that's uh, granted. So a lot of times you have to rely on the landlord and the landlord is the one that has to provide energy to you. In this case, most of it is just running through diesel generator. So if you have more forward planning, a bit more thinking, I think you can actually um, incorporate the renewable energy into your whole um, uh, setup. And uh, no pun intended, but I think really working with the right people I think that's why we also like our name. You know, we want, you need to choose the right people, work with the right people, partner the right people, you know, and, and that's how you can foray into Indonesia, which is a huge market. Of course, work with all the parties that's here are organizing this webinar as well. I'm coming to my conclusion. I thought I'd just leave this out there. You'll also be slammed with a lot of like uh, um, acronyms, you know, in Indonesia, and you'll be lost in, in all the different things. So I thought this little table will be helpful. But for specifically for solar, I think what's uh, interesting is that you need to have basically an IUJPTL. It's really your license to actually do solar. And uh, it's, it's a long list, but they kind of cut down and try and move everything online. But uh, these are probably all the different parties and, and uh, ministries that you have to work with to try and uh, get it done. And work together with yeah, ESG, I think uh, they'll definitely be able to help you. So this is my last slide. And I think uh, I really want to say that um, we should really make every day Earth Day, not just on one special occasion. We, we should focus on people, planet, profit. I think everything is important. If you don't make profit, you also can't support the people and you can't save the planet. So I think uh, our focus is a triple bottom line of people, planet, profit. My contact details are here. You can scan. My LinkedIn account is there. Um, I have another minute. So let me just check what notes if I've missed out. Yeah. Um, I think labor issues are also a concern that you might have to look into when you're working in Indonesia. Minimum wage is different for different cities that you work in. And um, local from Jakarta is not necessarily local from Balikpapan. So as you work in across the country, you have to respect local regulations as well. Currency risk is also another big concern. And I think uh, you can't just take Indonesian rupiah out of the country. So working with a good financier to address your your FX issues is, is a big thing um, where everyone tends to prefer to like being paid in US dollars or price in US dollars, but uh, there's just laws and regulations about how, how you can price and quote things as well. Mm. Yeah, so I think uh, really that's, the, that's all I have to say. I hope this has been helpful and uh, please reach out if you need anything. I hope we can work together and we can work with the right people. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Robin. And indeed, we want to make everyday Earth Day and work with the right people. So before we move on to our second polling session, I would like to share the results from our first poll here. May I have the results from the first polling session, please? So um, for the first question, would you consider taking on sustainable financing for your projects? We have 75% of the audience who are responding yes. So that's very encouraging. And for the remaining 17%, we hope that um, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to contact SBF or UOB, uh, write to my colleague Zichuan to sign up for the business clinic. And what would be your main reason if you decide not to adopt fi uh, sustainable financing? So most people are unsure about how to go about doing it. We have 37%. So do continue to watch out uh, for our webinars in this uh, UOB sustainable financing awareness series. Hopefully we can increase your awareness about how to do so. Right. So let's move on to our second poll for today. So I, ladies and gentlemen, if I can get um, you to think about what will actually make you take and take up sustainable financing, and should you have a project in mind, what is the time frame like for your business? May I have the poll questions launched, please? So again, you will see a poll with three questions on your screen. Answer all the questions and click on submit. This will actually serve as a basis for our discussion for the Q&A session later. And our next speaker is Mr. Jeremy Ong, Managing Director of B3 Energy. Jeremy has very extensive experience in the technical aspects of solar and photovoltaic. He has more than 12 gigawatt peak photovoltaic and over 1.5 gigawatt hour in energy storage solutions experience, and is very, very impressive. Jeremy has previously led regional teams in Phoenix Solar, which is a German company. Schneider Electric is an MNC headquarter in France, and most recently in BNB as the head of APEC in Solar. 
He will tell us more about the technical considerations and risk mitigations to watch out for in a PV roof project. Jeremy, the floor is yours. Hello. Um, Jeremy, can we get you to on your video, please? So for audience who are watching this webinar, feel free to type in your questions at any point of time using the Q&A function. And uh, let's give Jeremy a while more. Okay, so Jeremy is, has his video on. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, sorry about the slight technical uh, challenge over there. Uh, very happy to, to be here this afternoon to share a little bit uh, of my experience and knowledge on the technical side. Uh, thank you, uh, UOB, uh, SPF and Enterprise Singapore for allowing me this opportunity. Um, it's been very helpful and uh, in interesting as well for me to hear both uh, Jasper and Robin uh, share already in their presentations. And I think uh, for myself, it's just really putting on a slight slant on the technical side. So let me share uh, a bit uh, on how to mitigate some of the risks that you may have in projects, uh, solar projects that you are looking to either embark on or really have uh, been started before. So I will just have a quick, quick overview of the solar market uh, globally, but also regionally and also in Singapore. Uh, I will then look at project development risk that you might consider in your project, whether it's a rooftop CNI space or even a residential roof that you may be looking at personally. Um, and then look at key things to, to consider, you know, in the design technology and installation space. And I will end off um, with a few positive and negative examples uh, of what is a good PV installation and some things that you might not, uh, might want to be aware of to and be careful of and not uh, follow suit in the negative ones, okay? So I think um, over the last decade, and I think this has already been showed to some extent from uh, Jasper's slide that solar and renewables have really been uh, taking off at an astronomical pace. Uh, I, I think I started my journey in solar in 2008. And as you can see on this slide, that's really like the global market was nine, seven to nine gigawatts. Uh, and Germany was the largest market by far. Uh, I never ex expected to have a, a, a one gigawatt, uh, 100 gigawatt market a year, which was what we did uh, last year in, in, in 2020 as what uh, Jasper has also shared that even in COVID, um, the world uh, for solar still really moved ahead uh, really aggressively. Um, so you, you can see here, uh, at the end of 2020, um, solar is now standing at a cumulative 760 gigawatts. Uh, and I think it's just outpeaked wind, uh, which was actually a hit. Uh, hydro is, I think, at 1,300 gigawatts. But uh, at this rate that solar is moving, we really um, see solar, I think, outpace hydro in, by 2025 and uh, in the next two years, you know, exceed uh, 1,000 uh, 1, gigawatts easily. So uh, this is really exciting. And what's more exciting is to see that a lot of it is still driven by the Asian Pacific market uh, because there are big countries, there are growing markets in Asia. And I think the need for energy is really uh, continuing to grow. This is where the growth markets are. Um, and then you have obviously the uh, European and US markets, which are a little bit slow behind, but I think also still looking to see how to tap on this 
um, renewable resource that I, I think the world really needs at this moment. This is a, a slightly more detailed slide uh, on the different leading countries, um, cumulative as well as for annual installations in the end of 2020. Uh, on the left side, you see China leading uh, and then come Vietnam, Japan, India, Australia, and Korea. Um, it is still fairly dominant, as you can see from uh, Asia Pacific market, uh, the different players. And we still see a lot of it, you know, cumulatively still continue to be that uh, for a cumulative overall view. So this is the, the emphasis is that we are in the right place in Asia Pacific. We see this uh, continue to grow, maybe slightly slower in some markets and others, but I think in the next 10 years, we will see a really big um, next jump uh, in, in the growth of solar. And, and I say this only because I think 2020 has been uh, a watershed year where not just uh, a minority group of people are keen on, on being renewable, being green, um, as shared by Jasper in this presentation as well, where uh, financial institutions, co big corporates are all realizing that this has been, uh, this is really important and this is the, the way to sustainable uh, business. Um, so I think this is a very exciting time. So coming to Singapore, uh, a little bit closer home for, I guess some of you or if not a uh, majority of you on this call, um, this webinar. Um, similar trend you can see in this chart where Singapore has been growing uh, steadily over the last decade, a bit of uh, ups and downs maybe in the last two years, but uh, I think Singapore being a, a small island, we, we had been quite greatly uh, impacted on uh, with COVID like many others, but I think specifically on the construction side. So there's been a, a drop in, um, I think, overall installations last year. Uh, but I believe, however, this will, uh, will change, I think, going forward as we are managing better, I think, in, in this year. And I think we see, we will see a change in 2021. But uh, what I, you can pick out here from the information that you see here is that actually the private sector and residential sector, which is highlighted in, in blue bowl, uh, on the right side, um, it's a still a significant part. Uh, and I think this is where it could be very interesting for uh, players who are keen to embark uh, having solar on their facility, whether it's a commercial roof, uh, industrial roof, uh, or even in a, a residential home. So the slide which I want to bring to, to show now, as you can see, is really a, a, an overview of um, the development process of a project, a uh, um, typical uh, project which looks at project financing. Um, maybe it's CNI or ground mount, maybe not so relevant for uh, residential homeowners, but I think uh, for those who, who are looking to do CNI and other larger projects, this would be very similar to what you'll be looking at in the development financing execution. I bring about a few key parts is that there will be a technical um, emphasis at each step of the, the development phase where either you're doing technical studies in the development, project design, in the financing part or even execution part. There will be technical considerations to look at, uh, to consider. And I think in the next couple of slides, I will highlight a bit of how to mitigate and address some of them, okay? This slide is um, just identifying the difference between a commercial industrial roof and a private residential roof. Um, you know, part of it is the size and capacity of um, the roof itself for commercial industrial, usually above 20 kilowatts up to a few megawatts uh, that will be considered and usually connected to um, medium voltage or high voltage grid, depending on the size and capacity. Um, on the residential side, Anything up to 10, 20 kilowatts would be um, very usual. And I think most of them will be single or three-phase uh, low-voltage grid connection. 
one of the, um, the details I wanted to emphasize to between a commercial and a residential roof is that I think the difference is that you have slightly different um, risks involved where you might need to have, for example, a commercial industrial roof. You are lending on a project and the, the lenders were a bank, uh, maybe UOB, who are lending to you will have certain requirements. Uh, and there are also specific ones uh, for residential. And I think there's something which we need to emphasize that it could be a little bit more risky in terms of um, commercial risk, um, where you are actually trying to look at the returns itself um, on a financial gain. Um, maybe a residential is a little bit less of that. I'm not saying it's, it's not, um, but the quantum is also much smaller. And I think uh, there is slightly different emphasis on both. Um, you do see the importance of having um, a proper uh, technically sound um, project. Uh, and I say why so is that if you look at that, ultimately all of, all of these uh, risks would have a financial impact on you one way or another. Whether you realize it or not, uh, it will because at the end of the day, it's about the amount of electrons generated for either commercial roof or even a residential roof. So some of these points that um, highlighted below, whether it's a non-optimized design, poor installation quality, inaccurate modeling, wrong specification, can generally um, impact your your your. Your, and your PV systems generation between five to close to 15%. And I see this, uh, you know, with, with fairly amount, fair amount of certainty, having looked at quite a few different PV roof projects uh, in, in terms of their performance. And this, this is usually the case uh, where um, I think either investors or developers uh, may not be totally aware of some of these points and have uh, missed stuff on them. Okay. So to dive in, I think on this, this first two parts was technology and uh, design. I think that's always the kind of the foundation of how you want to start things correctly in your planning, because if you don't get that uh, fundamentally correct with the right assumptions, with the right design, Ultimately, you're setting up yourself for a bigger challenge to fix the problems in the future. And um, it is always a more painful and a more expensive um, process to, to, to rectify. And so the emphasis is really good technology selection where you have reliable, high quality products that are being used, uh, good design and optimization. And I say this because you, it is very different when you are looking to, to make every single percent uh, improvement on your PV system vis-a-vis -vis maybe you have a 10% plus minus sort of buffer. But if you, you're looking to put money into your bank, every single percent or half a percent uh, of interest in your bank account is important to you. And I think this is the same thing, I think in, in solar, if you are getting it right, you're putting it, uh, designing it right with the right system uh, and optimize using the right assumptions, you will really see the, the benefits and your returns uh, meet your, your financial um, forecast. So, so this is really based on um, a lot of projects that we've, I've seen personally over the last um, few years uh, in my experience. Um, the other part I think where I think um, that is probably not really well understood to some extent or completely aware of is that people usually think that um, lowest cost and uh, an installer is the same everywhere. But I think um, like what was mentioned in our, with, with Robin and with Jasper, um, I think they have already set up, or at least Jasper with you, Solar has set up already good um, installers that are already pre-qualified, selected, who are repeatable. Uh, and, and I think this is, is really important in the process. The reason for that is because if you have a good installer and EPC who is technically competent, who has um, the experience with the right uh, design, they will, they will do the, the list of these things uh, that I've mentioned here. 
follow the right codes, design codes, uh, best practices, they will be able to help you execute your project uh, on time, uh, on budget, okay? They will design it correctly with the right components and systems, which are high quality rather than cutting corners with someone which is uh, a tier two, tier, tier three um, supplier, which does not be able to have uh, reputation of, uh, of good quality. And also having the experience of not just designing, but managing the assets, you know, right design, right optimized design. Um, also with reputable EPC contractors, they will have, you know, standard contracts, which I think uh, are able to withstand, I think the quality and I think to, to consider the right uh, LDs in place as well, or termination clauses if the need arises. And I think lastly, it's about looking at o and uh, contracts where they are supporting you in the administration of your performance guarantees in, in, in this tenure with them. So all this, I think, plays a very important role with the EPC uh, or installer that you are looking to consider. Okay. So now I have a few, two more slides actually showing a bit of um, different examples of good, what's good installation. Uh, as you can see, you know, on, from the left top row, you're talking about good cable trays um, that are neatly uh, well managed and, and, and covered so that they are not exposed to the environment, uh, correct PV, um, earthing conditions from structures, how you mount your in inverters uh, that is correct ventilation based on the supplier's installation methods that they're not too closely packed. They have put in well ventilation places and not directly under the sun. Or even um, DC cable boxes uh, where you are bringing your string cables in with uh, correct labeling and safety labels as well. Um, these are points which one may think it's um, not so important or significant because maybe you do not see the, the need, but with, with all these, it actually helps bring up uh, the quality of the project where you have better uptime. Uptime means meaning that availability of your, your system is high so that if there is an issue that is uh, having one of your strings, you are not uh, searching for which is the particular string that is connected to this fuse uh, that you have to fix because you do, you're not labeling correctly. Uh, so these are seemingly simple, but I think important um, uh, to have uh, if you are looking to have a, a good overall system. Cable management, um, even your roof penetrating, uh, non-penetrating clamps on your roof so that you prevent your roof from having uh, water, water leaking issues, you prevent uh, maintaining the wolf warranty that, you, that you're installing on. So things, things like that are important. Moving on to another slide, which shows you slightly more uh, negative uh, examples. Um, ensuring that you have good products, I think uh, is I think a very simple and basic first step and good specification. So the, the top row uh, examples, partially uh, uh, quality issues uh, where you have DC junction boxes who are burnt um, because I think the, the products are not so um, well designed and tested. Um, and then you, you, you have fires occurring because of issues with the uh, back sheet qualities or junction boxes or uh, DC arcing. Um, the, the row below, uh, I think what is emphasizing more on the installation quality itself where they haven't been installed as well, where you have water ingress into let's say your combiner buses or your DC connectors are crimped not uh, as well as they should. Uh, that's why you have DC arcing on some of your connectors um, available or, or even simply, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the bottom right is uh, an installer, some of the installers who who were rushing off to, to, to go back and they did not uh, tape up the, the DC cables, which at the point wasn't live, 
But uh, you know, when you install the the modules at the other end, and uh, the sun came up, and you have a shot. So the, these are things that actually do happen. And if you are systematic and safe approach to doing things, um, these will not happen. Uh, happen less less often. So um, just wanted to to be able to identify some of the things that are less likely to happen if you are working with a good installer or EPC, okay? So last slide on in conclusion is really to, to say the, the first point that I think should consider is finding the right installer EPC because with that, you help really mitigate majority of the risks that you may have in your project. Um, that is really key. Second is to look at um, an optimized design with the right technology selection so that you start off on a good foundation without having to make major rectifications on your key equipment. Uh, and third is really to, to ensure your asset is managed well with a good O&M strategy and performance guarantees to, to ensure um, you know, things continue to, to perform well. So this, these are really my three main points to, to be that people can be aware of and take note of. So that really comes to the end for myself. Um, I'm be honest, I'm really happy to be able to share some of these insights. Uh, some may be already aware of them, but nonetheless, I think uh, always good to, to share for those who may not be so aware and are new to, to solar and are new to looking on it on the technical side rather than the financial commercial side. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to, to answer what you have uh, and be able to uh, work together with uh, SBF uh, to be able to help you on your solar journey. So thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Shu. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And indeed, it's very important for us to get and experience the PV installer or EPC. So... Before we move on to our Q&A session, I would like to share the results of our second poll with you that was conducted just now. May I have the results from the second poll, please? Yes, um, Jasper, coming from a bank, what are your thoughts on the results uh, of the second poll? Hi, Shu. Thanks. Um, I, I guess from the, um, uh, the second poll, if you look at the uh, the, the answers that was given, 58% say that potential cost saving is, is actually the most important consideration uh, on, on sustainable financing. I think this is, this is something that, uh, which, is, which is key and, and I would expect that uh, most of the, the building owners will say so because uh, that is something that uh, most of uh, the, the key driver in terms of saving, saving money uh, in uh, times like this when, when your revenue uh, is not growing as fast, uh, then you're looking at ways how to optimize your operating expenses. Huh? Yeah, so I, I, I'm not surprised at the, at the results uh, that we're getting. Um, uh, back to you, Shu, do you want me to take second or third questions? Yeah. Um, I think it's fine we, because we okay. do have a lot of questions. So I'd like to spend more time uh, addressing some of the questions from our audience at home uh, who have been very diligently posing the question to our speakers. So um, I have a few questions that are related to banking. And uh, so there's one question about the end of life of solar panels. You know, when we talk about solar panels and installing them, but exactly, you know, are there any sort of financing support for recycling or upcycling of solar panels? And if there's any financing in India, and that's a related question is, um, can UOB finance projects overseas? And if yes, which are the countries that the UOB have a strong foothold in? So um, Jasper, can you answer some of these questions? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll take it in reverse order. Yeah, um, so the first question is whether do we look at financing overseas? Yes, uh, as you can see from the presentation, uh, we, we look at uh, financing uh, solar projects in uh, our key countries like uh, Indonesia, Singapore, uh, Malaysia and Thailand. Uh, we have also financed solar projects in Vietnam as well. So we are you know, happy to, uh, if, you know, for you to come and talk to us if you have any 
uh, financing uh, requirements in in those uh, those countries. Um, second uh, question is on financing in India. Um, uh, we currently don't don't have a, a big presence in India. So in terms of the financing that we are looking at, if you're looking at um, a, a solar projects in India, uh, I think that's a bit uh, too far for us at the moment. Um, with regards to the first questions on um, financing end of life equipment, uh, that's quite an interesting um, uh, topic that uh, we are currently looking at this on a holistic manner because um, the NEA has, has a, a new program on, on circular economy, right? And uh, we are also uh, considering looking at not just uh, recycling of solar panels, but we're also looking at uh, other recycling of uh, recycling of metals. We are also talking to um, uh, the, the, uh, the waste collectors as well uh, for, for the WCS um, and part of that discussion also entails uh, e-waste as well. So, so if you look at the solar panel, you may consider that solar panel is also uh, kind of considered like a like an e-waste. And um, there is also currently a regulations globally uh, looking at requiring um, uh, the manufacturers to take back uh, the end of life equipment, and that is something that is a big. Uh, discussion points that uh, that can be uh, quite uh, quite interesting to create another economy uh, in the end. But coming back to the question on financing, I mean we are happy to to look at that. We haven't done that yet because there's not a lot of projects that come to uh, end of twenty years uh, at the moment. But I, I we would we would certainly from a sustainability perspective. Uh, would like to speak to anyone that's actually looking at this, uh, if you are doing uh, uh, panel recycling and things like that, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Jasper. And I, I do actually have a very interesting question now that I would like to pose to Robin. And uh, this question is on why do we want to invest now? This requires a 20-year commitment. And if we talk about the industry growing so fast, it's actually, it's actually suggesting that, you know, if we were to hold back and wait a few more years, to wait for the efficiency of solar panels to improve, then why do we need to invest now? Uh, why can't we wait a few more years? And, and subsequently, I have a, a question on the environment for you, uh, Robin, but if you can just answer this yeah, question. Sure. And actually, I think I see like 10 different questions for me to, to answer already. But the first question, I would say that the sooner you do it, the better it is. Because when you install uh, solar systems, it's actually the panels are actually just one aspect of the, the total system cost. There's also the inverters, there's also the cables, the structure. And in Singapore, actually, manpower is actually a significant cost as well. So during these COVID times, manpower, structure, licensing, transportation could actually add to the cost. So Typically, we will ask our clients, you know, like uh, for your factory roof or your home roof, you know, like uh, if you just moved in or you're going to move out in five years time, those kind of like uh, information is actually very important for us to plan as well. So if it's a new build or you know you're going to renovate next year, then I would say hold off. But if you're going to just move in and then you just uh, put in money for a new roof, yeah, why not to do so? Um, also, your neighbors play an important part. If your building is going to be higher and going to go cast shade onto your roof, then of course, uh, hold back as well. So uh, a lot of things are case-to-case -case basis. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to try and power through all the different questions uh, I have. Uh, first one from Angela. I think they said like there's no incentives for solar. I think solar is competitive on its own. If you're operating in remote areas in Indonesia, you understand that you need to power your operations. And if it's not by solar, then it's maybe by diesel or something else. And you realize that you don't need incentives to do so. You'll see you'll be very cost benefit. And uh, typically, the LCOE is almost 50 cents to a dollar. And that's why the break-even cost can be as fast as three years to five years. If you're on the grid in the city where you just buy energy from PLN, typically the energy is subsidized and it becomes more expensive for you to switch to solar. So for us, that's why we focus on the off-grid market. It's a bit harder to execute, but we believe that uh, the clients benefit and then we, uh, we actually help uh, do community impact as well. Can we install solar on the rooftop of private condominiums? Uh, I happen to be able to do this. So quite fortunately, if you Google uh, uh, Bugatima penthouse with solar on Straits Times, so you'll be able to see that we've been able to install solar on our condo rooftop. Yeah, uh, I'm wearing the Tesla t-shirt. Been waiting for it to arrive for five years already. Um, next one is really, 
what's the initial estimated capex for solar? I think uh, typically solar installations, as Jasper has mentioned, is addressed in uh, dollars per watt peak or kilowatt peak or megawatt peak. So it really depends on case to case basis. So that's how you kind of have like a levelized cost to, to see what's the uh, price of your solar system. Um, uh, on the mini green bond question at 342, uh, yes, if you did invest in our mini green bond, then you get the 30% return over the four years. Uh, details are also on our website. You can look out the full article there. We're quite transparent about it. Um, thank you, Jimmy, for that compliment. Um, floating solar. Yes, so actually uh, floating solar, there is like fresh water as well as uh, um, sea water, uh, I mean, um, offshore as well. So in Singapore, we have uh, Sunseed that has it in the Johor Straits. You also have uh, the ones here in our reservoirs. So floating solar is starting to be very feasible. And we are, our peer is actually looking to develop one of the largest floating solars in Indonesia. And the reason is that you don't really have to relocate villages or do civil works or to clear trees and all that. It's really literally using unused land and then you can execute and then have better performance with the cooling effects as well. So floating solar is certainly a feasible technology and, and, and ready to do so. Um, I think last one, I think that's all. I tried to cover all, this is like a game show. <laughs> uh, I think Jeremy, leave some time for you. Yeah, so thank you so much, Robin. And uh, if I can move on to Jeremy, there are also a lot of questions for you. Um, some, of the, some of them are pertaining to the technical aspects of installing uh, solar PVs. Um, if the rooftop solar PV system can cause water leakage on, on the roof, so who is responsible for, for that? Is it the EPC or the PV? system owner and can they claim insurance? So, so that's, a, that's a good point. I think uh, it is actually a, a mutually a discussed uh, point uh, with normally the, the roof owner uh, has a warranty from the, the, the roof builder itself for 10 years. So what I think is necessary is that if it's, it's shown proof that it is non-penetrating, that there are no already current leaks available uh, on the roof. Uh, if they are, that's really identified then I think there can be agreement to, to, with the, the roof owner and to negotiate with the, uh, the roofer itself to continue the warranty. So I've been involved with projects uh, on, in, in, in such similar situations already commercially in Singapore uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, so I, I think this is not, I think, a major um, issue, to be honest. It just needs to be uh, discussed uh, and, and worked up. So... Okay, thank you, uh, Jeremy. And uh, two other questions for you. Can you advise who are the leading technical advisors who are able to assist in the energy model assumptions? Oh, uh, that's and my... Yeah, so I think that, to, to quickly say, I think there are definitely a few. There are good leading um, technical advisors out there uh, with the big brand names. So I think you should reach out to them to, to be able to get uh, uh, some uh, good advice. So that can be can can be shared. I think I think in the, in the right forum. Um, the other part, I think, what was the other question that you? Yeah. So uh, the other question is, uh, what is the average lifespan for solar panels? Oh. Well, that's uh, what is warranted now between twenty five to thirty years um, is warranted, but there's been a lot of discussions about extension, uh, extended life of solar modules up to thirty five, even forty years. Uh, this is a very interesting discussion topic uh, in the US, in Europe, where they have really, uh, they, they are further ahead in their solar journey. So I think module life reliably 30 years now, I think with dual glass modules, we can see that. And I think the um, suppliers are quite happy to, 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 to be able to warranty that sort of duration. So just, just to, to be aware that even at 30 years, it does not mean that your solar panel is not operating. It is just that it's uh, from 100% is down to 80, 85%, which means still at the end of 30 years, you have 85% capacity of producing energy, which is, I think, a lot still. So it is, in my view, not worth throwing those modules away. It is still, it still can be used uh, if, you, if the warranty is still there. And I think if operationally it's still working, rather than uh, uh, putting them into a waste waste dump or recycling. So something to consider. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. And uh, I think I just want to have one last question for Jasper. Um, would UOB consider floating 
solar where the risk is high and there's no international standard. So Jasper, you got to put your off mute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thanks, uh, Shu. That's that's a very good question. I think um, the how how to answer this? Okay, it's going to be a high risk in anything that you do if you don't know what you're getting into. Yes. <laughs> so that's that's how I want to repeat that. So it will be high risk in anything that you do if you don't know what you're getting into. So from our perspective, if we are looking at the, no matter whether it's solar rooftop, ground mount, or even floating solar, uh, usually from a financial perspective, we will work with a, a good sponsors and also good EPC contractor as well as good technical advisor uh, in terms of verifying all the inputs um, with regards to uh, you know whether the 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 plantain, the support and 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 all the technical. Uh, stuff that you know our our technical advisor Jeremy can can comment on. So so from that perspective, the lenders will will get a independent uh, technical report uh, from from a technical advisor to verify mm -hmm. uh, all the technical aspect as well as the projection projections itself. So from that perspective, then as long as you have a very solid uh, PPA or power purchase agreement, uh, then it's something that we can look to finance. So. I, I think there was another question on whether we do uh, finance batteries and, and EVs as well. Yes, we, we are currently looking into that uh, in terms of EV financing. If you have any interest, do, do come and talk to us as well. Mm. Right. Thank you so much, Jasper. So um, contact UOB if you are interested. And uh, I, I think we have come to the end of our Q&A. Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, we will try to answer them after this webinar by writing, uh, by communicating with the speakers and getting back to you via email. Um, but you know, before we wrap up, can I get our panelists here to share with us their closing remarks? And if there's one thing that you would like our audience to take away from this session, what will it be? Can I have Jeremy to start sharing his closing remarks? So, so I, I think for for myself as a technical advisor, I think. Selecting an experience right, uh, installer and PC is really crucial and fundamental. Um, and because with, with that first right step, finding the right people as what uh, Robin's uh, uh, company's name and philosophy as well, with the right people, I think everything else will fall into place. Uh, and you really help mitigate a lot of the other risks that uh, will occur and can occur in, in your project. So this is my key takeaway uh, for, for the audience. Find the right installer, right experience uh, EPC for your project, yeah. Thank you, Jeremy and Robin, over to you. Um, I was gonna say that actually we are still, I mean, there's been a lot of growth in the last couple of years, but I think we are still very early stage in the whole uh, green wave. And I think uh, we should, if, if, if I can encourage you, don't just chase it for the financial returns. I think really look at your future generations. We're really blessed to be here in Singapore to, 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 to have everything that we have. But just look at our neighbours and you realise that there's so much can be done. We really need to export the knowledge, the know-how, use Singapore as a base and expand across to our neighbouring countries and be a good neighbour. So I hope everyone can join this movement you know, to fight climate change and we do it for our future generations. Thank you, Robin. And last but not least, Jasper. Yeah, thanks. I, I think the, the takeaway from us is, I, I think, uh, you know, 10 years or, or even, uh, you know, five years ago, people don't think that, you know, uh, the, re the, the renewable sector can, can take off, right, uh, in a big way. But I think we, we all have been uh, proven otherwise. And, and I truly believe that, you know, what uh, Robin has mentioned with regards to environmental sustainability, and this, this needs to come out a lot more. Um, and, and for the, the finance director or, or, or business owners, you know, this is something that you should be tapping on because the cost uh, has come down quite significantly. And it is where the return that we're looking at is around four to five years. Uh, and also um, the, the the environment, environmental impact of it uh, is, is truly significant. So I would do really encourage you to, uh, to come along, you know, side uh, us uh, on this journey uh, so that we can help you also to, to save money as well as 
your home as well. Yeah, thanks, Shu. Sure. Thank you, Jasper. And indeed, what we can do as businesses, be it large companies or small companies, we want to be able to meet the needs now without compromising the ability of our future generations to meet their own needs. And uh, on behalf of SBF, we would like to thank the speakers for joining us and addressing this very important question on solar financing. Uh, can I get the speakers to stay back um, and wait for the last slide? Yeah. So up next on our calendar, we, we, will, we will be organizing two exciting webinars for you. First is on smart cities. The SBF has partnered with Smart Cities Network and we have invited prominent speakers from the Iskandar Regional Development Authority and Digital Penang to tell us more about opportunities in Malaysia. And if you are a Singapore company interested to partner Malaysian companies in infrastructure project, you should attend this webinar, which is happening two weeks from now. And next on the 22nd of July, we'll be having the third episode of the UOB uh, series on circular economy. We will deep dive into topics such as plastics and e-waste recycling, and we want we hope that you can actually join us and explore opportunities created by the circular economy in the region. And last but not least, uh, do sign up uh, for our complimentary business consultation session with Zichuan to register your interest. And if you want to find out more about SBF Infrastructure Committee and the work that we deal with, uh, you can use your mobile phone and scan the first QR code that will lead you to the SBF Infrastructure Committee website. If you're interested to, uh, we, we strongly encourage you to join us uh, by filling up this online form uh, to, to join our infrastructure interest group. And it's actually a, a, you know, a mailing list and we'll keep you updated about the, the events and infrastructure uh, developments and projects, uh, opportunities regularly. And last but not least, we would appreciate if you can take some time to fill up a short survey form that is administered by a third party consultant, Forbes Research, pertaining to this webinar by scanning the QR code on your screen. It will only take you less than five minutes. And so uh, before we leave, right, can we actually have uh, all the speakers to take a group photo? So look at your camera and one, two, three, cheese. So once again, my name is Julian from the Singapore Business Federation, and I'm pleased to be your host for today. Thank you for staying with us over the past one and a half hour. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you again.